Good day, everyone. On behalf of BioIT World's Global Web Symposia Series and our sponsor, Cofactor Genomics, I'd like to welcome you to Clinical Validation of a Multidimensional Pan-Cancer Immune Assay. My name is Elizabeth Lamb, and I'll be the host and the technical director for today's event. Now, I'd like to introduce our moderator. She is Dr. Natalie LaFranzo, PhD, Director of Scientific Projects with Cofactor Genomics. Welcome, Dr. LaFranzo. The presenter ball is yours. Thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you to the entire team at Cambridge Health Tech for your help in making this webinar possible. I'm going to start off the webinar by making a bold statement that individual molecules, mutations, or genes are insufficient as biomarkers for complex therapies like immunotherapy. A good example of an individual marker is PDL1, the most commonly used diagnostic for PD1 or PDL1 checkpoint inhibitor therapies, such as PEMBRO or NEVO. And in discussing PDL1, the European Society for Molecular Oncology put it plainly that PDL1 immunohistochemistry is not suitable as a biomarker for selection of anti PD1 or PDL1 inhibitors. Moreover, the Society specifically recommends a multi component predictive biomarker for patient selection of immunotherapy drugs. And current methods for characterizing the immune system attempt to use all possible biological materials and methods, but all of these only show modest ability to predict response to therapies. And the vast majority of clinical samples are stored as FFPE materials, which limits the technologies that are available for analysis. RNA sequencing specifically has shown value because it has the potential to tell you much more about the disease and its progression. This has led to significant investment in precision and personalized medicine, searching for an elusive signal in hopes of finding powerful biomarkers. But the truth is, there is no single RNA gene signal, fusion, or even pathway that can accurately predict a disease state. Diseases are far more complex than that. And this is especially true for cancer and immunotherapy. The inability of these technologies to comprehensively characterize immune response is likely because most are only looking at those individual markers, which are not robust. And as computational biologists, we at Cofactor recognize the power of big data and the complexity of biology. We've decided to apply the power of machine learning to RNA expression and develop a new multidimensional model for predicting cancer biomarkers. We invented a new discipline called predictive immunomodeling, which creates robust pictures of how to better predict a patient's response to therapies. We call these powerful representations health expression models. These health expression models go far beyond the scope of a single gene and include multiple facets of biology, looking both at the presence or absence of RNA, as well as the dynamic expression levels. These can be influenced by the state of the disease, environmental effects, therapies, et cetera. So the shift to a new way of modeling cells, patients or cancer, can be extended to, in the future, treatments, which can produce an accurate model of a patient's risk of cancer, their response to a treatment or drug, and the overall prognosis of their health outcomes. Specifically, in the immunoprism assay, We've applied this approach to develop superior models for the immune cells, which play an integral role in fighting disease, particularly in the tumor microenvironment. These immune cells have been shown to be powerful potential biomarkers for understanding response to immunotherapy, but methods to detect them have been semi-quantitative at best. We call each of these immune expression models by their more common names, such as CD4 positive T cell, Treg, et cetera, based on the original cell donors that were used to generate the models. So today, you'll hear about how these immune expression models are used in the immunoprism assay to characterize the immune cells present in a solid tumor sample. The assay accepts all solid tumor materials and delivers a fully analyzed report, which quantitatively breaks down the immune cells present. And at the end of the talk, after you've learned about the assay and its performance, I'll share more about how this technology may be applied to biomarker discovery. So at this time, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Dr. Dunkevich is the Director of Hemopathology <laughs> at Washington University in St. Louis. He is board certified in anatomic pathology, clinical pathology, molecular pathology, and hematopathology, and is active both in clinical service and translational research. Dr. Dunkevich, along with others in the Department of Pathology and Immunology, was instrumental in establishing the first next generation sequencing based oncology diagnostics laboratory at an academic medical center in 2011. He has authored numerous manuscripts detailing clinical sequencing methods and is a world-recognized leader in the field of sequencing-based diagnostics. 
In addition, Dr. Dunkevich serves as the medical director of Cofactor Genomics, a leader in clinical RNA sequencing. Dr. Dunkevich's grant funded research is focused on understanding the clonal evolution and progression of myelo. <laughs> Yes. I'll let you say it. Myelodysplastic syndrome. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. <laughs> Including the application of molecular based measurable residual disease, MRD monitoring, to determine treatment response. Dr. Dunkevich is going to start us off by providing a solid foundation of the principles of clinical validation, specifically following the guidelines prepared by the College of American Pathologists. Thank you, Eric. Thanks, Natalie. Um, so I'm just going to give you some background on the CAP. A CLIA validation process for running assays in, in the clinical laboratory. And so, first, I just want to define, you know, what a clinical laboratory test is. And basically, any test where results are returned to a patient or a physician to be used to make clinical care decisions are a clinical test and then fall under uh, regulation by the CLIA or the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendments Act of 1988. Under this act, College of American Pathologists, or CAP, provides laboratory accreditation. And Cofactor Genomics is a uh, CLIA-approved laboratory as well as a CAP-accredited laboratory. Um, we've been a CAP-accredited laboratory since 2015. And CAP requirements are fairly stringent, and they include numerous directives that have to be met, including certification of all testing personnel, a continuous quality improvement program, rigorous criteria for assay validation. We'll talk a little bit more about that and how it pertains to immunoprism in the next few slides. So it requires uh, medical director oversight of all testing, participation in bi-yearly external uh, validation uh, testing. It also requires that a pathologist review all formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissues uh, prior to sequencing. And we'll talk about that a little bit too and what that means for the immunoprism assay. Um, CAP laboratories are also uh, subject to unannounced external inspections. And so the CAP, the immunoprism assay, and most uh, clinical molecular assays are run as laboratory developed tests or LDTs. And so clinical molecular testing is considered a high complexity test under the uh, CLIA 88 Act. And as I mentioned, molecular testing is, is generally performed as a laboratory developed test. And these are not specifically FDA approved assays. Laboratory derived tests uh, may use a, a mix of vendor supply reagents, as well as proprietary reagents and commercially available equipment. But uh, these laboratory developed tests must be rigorous, rigorously validated, validated by each individual laboratory. And as I mentioned, laboratory derived tests at present are not regulated uh, by the FDA. So I just put this together to kind of show you some of the uh, requirements that the College of American Pathologists puts out for a laboratory uh, developed test to be validated. And so it's a fairly rigorous process uh, and it involves determining the sensitivity of the assay uh, to certain standards, the specificity, reproducibility. So, for example, uh, if, if this assay is run by multiple techs in the laboratory or multiple pieces of equipment, do you get the same answer? Um, there's also stringent sample requirements. So, for example, if the process starts with FFPE tissue, a formal fixed paraffin embedded tissue, it has to re be reviewed by a pathologist. If it starts from extracted nucleic acids, RNA in particular, it has to be, uh, that RNA has to be extracted in another CAP or uh, certified laboratory. Uh, it also requires the uh, demonstration of the reportable range of the assay. So that is, what's the maximum and minimum value that can be reported? Requires uh, determining minimum QC metrics. So for example, um, how do you know that for any individual case that the sequencing data is adequate? Um, and so those have to be rigidly defined as part of the validation document. We also have to uh, take into account pre-analytic factors, so any interfering substances that may cause false positive or false negative results in the assay have to be investigated. Those are things like heparin, for example, in heparin tubes, EDTA and EDTA tubes, things like melanin, if you're sequencing melanomas, have been shown to uh, be PCR inhibitors, and so those are things we have to take into account when we validate the assay. So intertech variability, 
mentioned that uh, before, but basically, if you have multiple techs who are performing the assay, you have to demonstrate that it doesn't matter which tech is performing the assay, you get the same result. And so we have to do numerous uh, cases, uh, sequence numerous cases where libraries and the wet lab workflows prepared by different technologists. Uh, we have a rigid lockdown informatic analysis in wet lab protocols. So this, when we develop this assay and test it, every all, the entire process is locked down. It doesn't change. And this is different from a research lab assay because we don't make ad hoc changes to the protocol. This is a lockdown protocol. When we want to make changes, we we have to uh, demonstrate the validity of those changes, and they don't that they don't change our end results. And so we have to do another validation anytime we change the any of the analysis or any of the workflow uh, items. A pathologist reviews all the slides that start from FFPE or formal and fixed paraffin embedded tissue. That's a cap requirement. We also uh, participate in proficiency testing. Um, and so that means that every six months uh, we do an external validation of our assay. And we also have a formal uh, quality assurance process where every month we review uh, any uh, deviations from a process, uh, from, from our quality process. And we uh, make, you know, make changes to processes as needed. Um, we're also subject to external inspections. So just briefly, uh, John, in the next section of this talk, is going to talk, is going to show some actual data for how the immunoprism assay was validated. But I'm just going to present you uh, some of the ideas here, um, just in general terms of how we determine, for example, sensitivity and specificity. And, and John's going to go through, again, more specific examples. But I think this just to kind of take you through this toy example here. So how do you determine sensitivity for this assay? And so the immunoprism assay uh, measures uh, essentially four immune cell components. And so how do you uh, how do you know you know how do you know that you can sensitively detect CD19 positive uh, B cells or T regs? And so we did this in part in the validation by uh, selecting uh, or sorting uh, cell populations for each of these different immune cell types. And then mixing them, mixing each of these pure immune cell types together, different ratios. And then we took that mix and then diluted it with cell line DNA or cell line cells, in this case, prostate cancer cell lines. And we uh, mixed, mixed these together. And then we analyzed, uh, extracted RNA, and then uh, analyzed this by uh, immunoprism. And since we knew, we know the exact ratio of the components, the immune cell components and the cancer cells uh, going into these mixes, it allows us to determine the sensitivity. We can do things like, you know, increase the ratio of cancer cells to immune cell components or change the ratio of immune cell components to one another, and that allows us to calculate sensitivity. And specificity, so for example, how do we know that the, the signal that we're getting for CD19 positive B cells, specific to CD19 positive B cells, and doesn't overlap with, for example, the Treg expression signature. And so, using this this example, what we do is essentially we leave that sample out of the mix, and then ask, do we still see that that CD19 uh, positive signal? And so that's one way we can determine specificity and sensitivity of the assay, which is a large part of the College of American Pathologists requirements uh, to validate the assay. Reportable range of the assay. So this is the reportable range. Of, uh, the immunoprism assay uh, reports these uh, four different immune cell types, and I'll let John talk uh, a little bit more about that. And then CAP also requires us to validate each specific sample type that we sequence with the immunoprism assay. So that includes formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissue, fine needle aspirate material, fresh tissue. Um, so each of these are treated as different sample types by CAP. And because uh, RNA extracted from these different uh, sample types, especially formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissue, behaves differently. During the validation process, we uh, sequenced uh, numerous examples of each of these sample types just to, just to show that uh, the immunoprism results are robust enough to, uh, to overcome some of these uh, pre-analytic factors that are associated with the sample processing, especially in formalin fixed tissue. And then another significant difference between, uh, you know, CAP or clinical validated assay versus a research assays. We, we, there are requirements that uh, we review the slides or, or blocks if, if this is a FFPE, uh, if, if the process starts with formal and fixed paraffin embedded tissue. And the reason for that is um, a lot of times 
samples that are sent uh, for uh, sequencing-based analysis uh, either contain very little tumor or no tumor at all. And so this part of our you know, QA, QC process is to first look at the cancers. Uh, and so pathologists will look at all the slides or blocks that come in just to ensure that there's enough uh, tumor cellularity. It's not a, a section, for example, if it's a, if it's a block and you've cut all the way through the tumor, that you're, you, know, you actually have tumor tissue here. And this is a representative piece of tissue. So there's a lot of pre-analytic evaluation that goes in before we even start any of the sequencing process. CAP also has reproducibility and training requirements. Um, so CAP requires that uh, all validated assays perform the same no matter who does the work or what instrument it's sequenced on. And this applies to all the laboratory equipment as well as all the uh, technologists performing this test. The CAP also has strict uh, minimum education and experience requirements for all laboratory testing personnel. And CAP requires that laboratory personnel uh, participate in continuing medical education, as well as document proficiency testing twice a year to demonstrate that they are competent uh, in terms of uh, producing high quality results. Another thing that kind of sets clinical assays apart from research assays is that um, the College of American Pathologists requires uh, very stringent quality management plans. And part of that includes uh, external proficiency testing measured at least every six months. And this is really to ensure that the assay is not subject to any uh, systematic error or drift over time. And for some CAP assays or some uh, clinical assays, there, is a, there are uh, College of American Pathologists sponsored proficiency testing. Uh, the laboratory can participate in. Since immunoprism is a novel uh, RNA-seq-based assay, there is no uh, prescribed uh, College of American Pathologist sponsored proficiency testing. So the cofactor uh, genomics laboratory participates in sample exchange with other laboratories every six months as part of an alternative assessment. And this, again, uh, ensures robust quality uh, for our assays. And all aspects of the assay are monitored and logged. And so we keep track of uh, things, for example, reagent lots, um, sample storage conditions, all of our uh, refrigerated storage is monitored 24 hours a day. Um, it's all on redundant power to make sure that uh, uh, reagents don't go out of temperature range. All of our equipment has to be under uh, maintenance contract and has to be inspected. All sample handoffs and workflows have to be documented. And all incidents and deviations from, from our laboratory protocols are documented and reviewed by the laboratory director and the medical director. And this is, uh, this is part of our quality management plan. And it really ensures that um, clinical results generated in the laboratory are accurate. And so another thing, another thing that sets um, clinical laboratories apart from research laboratories that were subject to inspection really uh, at any point in time, at a minimum, the lab is subject to an unannounced inspection uh, at least once every two years. It could be more often. And inspectors uh, review compliance with CAP directives um, through inspection of both the physical space, uh, review of personnel files to ensure training is adequate and educational requirements are met. The inspectors will review the assay validation documents and ensure that they are that they meet all the College of American Pathologists uh, directives. They'll review sample logs and any cases that are uh, reported to ensure again that that uh, robust quality metrics have been met. And so, in summary, the uh, immunoprism assay is a CAPCLIA validated laboratory developed test, or LDT, meets uh, clinical, uh, rigorous clinical standards. Immunoprism results can be used for clinical decision making and clinical uh, care. The immunoprism assay produces highly sensitive and specific estimates of immune cell components from formal and fixed paraffin embedded tissue, as well as from other tissue types. And because of this robust uh, quality assurance program, uh, the immunoprism uh, results are highly reproducible. Excellent. Thank you so much, Eric, for that great introduction. And I'd now like to introduce Cofactor's Chief Scientific Officer, John Armstrong. John Armstrong has over 15 years of experience in assay and technology development, and more recently in the application of next generation sequencing technologies to diagnostics and assay development. John's career began at the Washington University Genome Center in the Technology Development Group, where he was instrumental in the development of assays related to the characterization of bacterial pools for the Human Microbiome Project, sequence typing of methicillin-resistant <laughs> staph. MRSA. <laughs> Thank you, MRSA, <laughs> and AML. 
In 2009, John co-founded Cofactor Genomics, where he serves as Chief Scientific Officer and has supervised the development of several RNA-based LDTs. So John is going to take the great foundation of CAP guidelines that Eric has provided us, and will share some exciting results from Cofactor's CAP validation study. John, over to you. Thanks, Natalie. Um, as Natalie mentioned, uh, my name's John, and today I'm going to cover the validation approach and data for the immunoprism assay. Uh, as You've heard from Natalie, it measures the presence of various adaptive immune cells in the tumor environment. And, um, and this enables researchers to assess that the actual immune response to a cancer it has strong implications, of course, in research, as it enables immune oncology researchers to measure the method of action and, and potentially predict the response to drugs. We perform the validation of the immunoprism assay using 57 samples, including six controls. From those 57 samples, we generated 86 libraries and, uh, and, and, from, and controls for testing. Uh, the specimens we used were obtained from both normal and disease tissue, and these included breast, clear cell renal carcinoma, head and neck, lung adenocarcinoma, melanoma, and prostate adenocarcinoma. And these samples were selected to really reflect the anticipated specimen types for the assay. And as you can see here, a large proportion of these samples are FFPE human solid tumor tissue samples. We also wanted to obtain an appropriate number to provide a reasonable assessment of the assay performance. And of course, positive and negative control samples from commercial cell lines were included in the validation. So these samples that you see here in the table were processed with the immunoprism tumor profiling molecular workflow and analysis pipelines in order to establish the performance characteristics of the assay and that's what I'll be covering with you today. You can see here that um, we have a, vi a di diagram of the validation design. I thought this might be good to, to show as we move through e um, each of these major sections. Uh, you can see here we have the samples uh, that I just talked about in the table. And with those, we uh, wanted to perform an immune cell estimation using, um, um, using uh, mixes of different immune cells. We wanted to also perform the immune profiling with immunoprism with interfering substances, as, um, as Eric has already mentioned, and I'll talk about that then. We wanted to then take and apply immunoprism to, to, to samples that were as closely related to the ones that we uh, might be receiving for the assay, which is FFPE. And then finally, we wanted to get as um, um, validate immunoprism on samples that were as close to a tumor as we could get. Uh, using, uh, in this dust for, for the immune profiling of the microenvironment, we use DTCs. So these are the, um, these four areas are the main ones I'll cover, and also you'll see a, a slide like this one at the beginning of each section to help, help uh, better delineate where we're at. So as we've talked about, the immunoprism assay is, is, was designed and is able to robustly measure the relative presence of eight different cell types from the adaptive immune system. We showed them earlier, but I think it's worth mentioning now. When we say major cell types, we mean CD4 plus T cells, CD8 plus T cell, CD14 monocytes, CD19 plus B cells, CD56 plus natural killer cells, M1 macrophages, M2 macrophages, and T regulatory cells or Tregs. So in this section, I'm going to show how the assay can reliably capture the levels of each of these eight cell types when they are the only cells present in the mix. So this experiment really sets the stage for the capabilities of the assay, and it shows, shows how well the molecular analysis uh, components of the assay capture the variability that exists among the eight immune cell types. So for this experiment, we isolated using uh, fluorescent-activated cell sorting, or FACS, six types of peripheral blood mononuclear cells, or PBMCs. Uh, those uh, were CD4, CD8, CD14, CD19, CD56, and Treg. We then took and in vitro grew monocytes and pulled them to M1 macrophage or M2 macrophages, and, and then also included those in the mixtures as well. So what we did is we took these cells and we mixed them at cascading ratios of each cell type um, into each sample. So we, had, we ended up with eight samples such that each one had a different ratio of, cell, of cells. And in this table, the blue is a higher proportion, and red represents a lower, and you can see this in the bar legend on the right of the table. And then what we did is, once we made these mixtures, we then assayed these samples on flow cytometry to confirm the true ratio. Of course, we had target ratios, 
uh, which were what we did the mixes under, but then we, we took them, put them on flow cytometry to confirm the, the true ratio of the PBMC cell derived um, cell types present in each of the samples. And what you're seeing here in this table are the percentages from the flow cytometry experiment. So in other words, with the flow cytometry, we are setting ourselves up with a known for this or an expected. So uh, we then took those samples and we ran the immunoprism assay uh, on all of these mixtures and we compared them to the known values uh, that I showed in the previous table. So those results are shown here where we visualize the known values from flow on the y-axis versus the values estimated by the immunoprism assay on the x-axis for each of the eight cell types for all eight samples. And then on the right, the plot there, it shows the same data as the left, except that it's zoomed in on the lower left portion of where the cell types are present. In the left graph, it's zoomed in um, to show the cell types at uh, lower than or equal to 5%. So in the top left of the plots, we show the performance across all cell types, and we do this by calculating statistics across all the data points. And those statistics in the, in the upper left are trueness, uh, uh, represented by the average error, precision as the first standard deviation around the average error, accuracy as the root mean squared error, and R squared as the coefficient of determination to a slope of one. On the bottom right, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the, um, the legend there, we show the accuracy for each cell type individually next to the name of the cell type. And so from these results, you can see that the assay can characterize the amount of different cell types in diverse samples. We see a very low trueness of error of nearly 0%, which indicates little bias in the assay, assay estimations. We see also a very low error in the precision and accuracy of less than 4%. And in the context of this experiment, this suggests that the performance of capturing individual cell types is unencumbered by the value of other cell types. The R squared value is high at 0.9, and this suggests that our assay performs well no matter the absolute amount of a cell type present. And because the correlations or this correlation is measured versus a slope of one, it shows the assay can measure the amount of cell types within and across samples. Um, and uh, this is an important strength for characterizing intra and intra-sample variation in clinical samples and also allows researchers to compute the ratio, the cell ratio comparisons within a sample. So in, uh, taken in, in total, these results show that our assay is able to differenti differentiate between relative amounts of different immune cells within a wide reportable range of 0 to 45 percent for all cell types. And next, I'm going to talk about uh, immune profiling with uh, potentially interfering substances. So, of course, we developed the immunoprism assay to be able to estimate the relative presence of different cell types. However, we also want it to um, estimate the relative presence of those cell types, even in the presence of non-immune cell mRNA. So this is important because input clinical samples will have the diverse set of non-immune and immune cell types present. Those include organ tissue and cancer and stroma and immune and others. Also, input samples may have varying levels of functioning and non-functioning RNA. So in this section, uh, we wanted, I'm going to show how we address these potentially confounding factors by showing the performance of the assay in the presence of two interfering substances, ribosomal and non-immune RNA. So for these experiments, we generated mixes of immune cells isolated from PBMCs and grown in vitro, similar to what I talked about in the previous section. However, in, in, in this case, we included PC3 uh, prostate cancer cell lines as a known controlled amount of non-immune content in the samples. And so starting from a supermix of all eight cell types, the amount of PC3 cells was titrated to create six samples with decreasing amounts of immune content. So here you can see we start out with a supermix of all eight cell types at 100%, and then we start to include greater percentages of the prostate cancer 3 cell line in the right column to generate uh, samples with 100, 50, 25, 10, 5, and 2 percent immune content. And um, as a side note, which I'll cover in a couple more slides, the samples, when we, when we um, prep these samples for the immunoprism assay, they had varying levels of ribosomal RNA contamination that ultimately results from just the normal library preparation procedure. But I'll show that the ribosomal content in these samples is typically 
zero to 25, but rarely at really low immune percentages can approach 80%. And so using that, that is a, a good way to measure interfering substances with ribosomal RNA. So we generated five replicate sets of these six PC3 titrated, titrated samples. And this uh, uh, gave us 30 individual specimens to run on the immunoprism assay. And so with that, we could compare those to these known percentages of mixes. And that's what we're showing here, where uh, the results for the individual cell types are shown in, um, in, in both of these figures. We have the same kind of format here where the right figure is the zoom in of the left figure, and it's showing the cells at 5% uh, or lower um, in the right. But let's, st let's start with the, the left figure. Also, the way that we're calculating statistics and visualizing this is the same as, as the previous slide as well. But in this case, we're also including next to the cell names in the left side, the accuracy and the precision measurements for each cell type. So um, the, graph in, on, uh, the graph A on the left side um, it shows that the assay performs accurately despite potential sources of interference. And for these samples, the assay has a high trueness of less than 5% error, or sorry, 0.5% error, a high precision with a standard deviation of less than 3%, high accuracy of less than 3% error, and that's seen across all cell types. Within the cell types, the assay performs better for some cell types than others. As an example, CD4 and CD56 seem to be under and over called at uh, 3.4 and around 5% mean error, respectively. However, M1 and M2 cell types are called with less than 1% mean error. We're also seeing a high R squared value to a slope of one, and this indicates that the assay is accurate at calling absolute values, really making immunoprism one of the first assays that is able to provide inter and intra sample comparisons of cell types, as well as one of the first assays that allows researchers to develop ratio comparisons of immune cells within a sample. Since immunoprism estimates the presence of almost all major immune cell types, and some would argue, I would argue, the presence of, of most major immune cell types, the assay is also able to determine the percent immune content that's present in the bulk sample. And so the results of estimating this total immune content is shown in these two figures. On the current slide, we are following the same format here. The left side is the 0 through 100 percent. The right side is the zero, zoomed in 0 to 10 percent. And essentially, what we're doing is we're summing the percentages of all of the major immune cell types. And that sum then represents the uh, percent immune content in that sample. And these results show that the assay has high trueness, precision, accuracy, and R squared when measuring the total immune content present in a bulk sample, and this is important, important when trying to understand the significance of increasing or decreasing total immune cells in a tumor sample. Uh, also, this is one of the first assays that can reliably do this as well. Earlier, I talked about, um, um, earlier I talked about being able to understand some of the, or I've, I've shown zoomed in figures for each of these, and now I want to talk a little bit about, about how we um, can use that. And, and what that represents. So in this slide, we're presenting the performance of, of the immunoprism assay when estimating cell types in low amounts, where the, where the precision of the assay per cell type becomes more critical. And so we define the limit of detection, we'll use LOD, so you'll hear me say LOD, limit of detection, in order to characterize how little of a cell type can be measured by the assay. And we define the LOD as the minimum known value for which the precision of a cell type can be retained. And we calculated this for each of the cell types, and we visualized this as a horizontal line in the graph on the right. But also we include the LODs for each cell type here in the table. And cell types like M1 and M2 have a very low limit of detection at uh, less than 0.1%, while CD56 has a higher limit of detection of, of around 1.2%. And when looking at the total of all immune cells, our samples do not reach a potential limit of detection, so we cap the LOD at uh, uh, LOD of measuring the total immune content at our highest titrated sample, 2%. And, and what's interesting is since we know the true value for the expected amount of each cell type, because we, we made the mixes uh, with the prostate cancer three cell lines, uh, we, know the we know the true values. We can use the true values to now estimate the specificity of the assay 
by looking at true negatives over all negatives below our limit of detection. And what we see there is, is from this, uh, we're able to calculate the analytical specificity of the assay at 97.5%. Uh, to kind of finish up this section here on, on uh, con uh, interfering substances, as I mentioned earlier, we have ribosomal content that can come through in some of the library preparation procedures depending on the immune cell content. And uh, in this case, we're going to show results here. So the previous results that I've shown demonstrated that the assay performs well under, um, under potential confounding factors, um, and, and, and such as cancer cells, uh, RNA, and, and also uh, some blush at, at, at looking at ribosomal RNA. And, um, but here, we want to understand whether these interfering substances have any specific effect on the assay. And so we analyze the accuracy of our assay as a function of these potentially interfering substances. The effect of ribosomal content on the assay is shown in the left column of the above figure. And here we show the estimate, estimation error on the y-axis against the ribosomal content on the x-axis for each cell type, and then we fit a line to that data. The slope m and the coefficient of determination r squared those are shown to the right of each of the cell types, uh, cell type subplots. And uh, for all cell types, we see a slope close to zero and a, a very small R squared value. So these results suggest that ribosomal content cannot predict the error. Therefore, one can conclude that the assay performs independent of ribosomal content. Uh, in the column on the right, we see how the assay performs with increasing amounts of non-immune content in the sample represented by the prostate cancer three cells. And similar to, similar to the left side of the figure, we're showing the estimation error, but here as a function of the total known immune content. So these plots show strong correlations to the linear fits, for example, M1 and T regs. However, the fits are at a slope of close to zero and so this suggests that the effects from non-immune content, such as cancer cell RNA, are very low. Uh, therefore, we can conclude that the assay performance is nearly independent of a non-immune content down to the limit of detection of individual cell types. In this next section, uh, I'm going to be talking about immune profiling of the tumor environment uh, utilizing disassociated tumor cells, or DTCs. So this type of sample starts as a chunk of tumor tissue and is then processed to disassociate the cells. Dis these disassociated tumor cells are really the nearest approximation to a formal and fixed paraffin embedded tumor sample that we can get while still retaining the ability to, to measure the cells by flow cytometry. This is an important aspect of these types of samples. So in order to measure the performance of, of the DTC samples with immunoprism, we tested samples originating from ovarian adenocarcinoma, lung adenocarcinoma, and melanoma tumor tissue. And so the figure on the left, we plot the known value um, from flow cytometry on the y-axis against the estimated value from the immunoprism assay on the x-axis. In the upper left, you, we show the accuracy, um, uh, same thing here, calculated as root mean squared error over all cells for all samples and for each disease individually. And we also show the accuracy for the individual cell types across the disease types in the lower right next to the cell names. Um, so we're showing results here for five cell types, CD4, CD8, CD19, CD56, and Tregs. And for this experiment, we see modest accuracy for the cell types measured by the assay. And the tissue with the best predictions was lung adenocarcinoma with around 5% RMSE while the most challenging sample was melanoma at a, around 11.5% error. So um, um, when looking at the sum of immune cell percentages, which is shown on the uh, right side of the graph, I'm sorry, on the right graph, the total immune content predictions had the same error. And in general, immunoprism estimated a higher percent uh, presence of cells than measured by flow cytometry. And, and interestingly, this discrepancy could be due to several factors. One of those may be that during the disassociation of the tissue, a poor portion of cells may have lysed, and in this case, immunoprism, because we're looking at RNA, would measure the lysate while flow cytometry would not, since it's looking at uh, intact cells. In this experiment, um, as I mentioned, immunoprism performs more modestly. However, uh, immunoprism still captures the relative ranking of different samples, 
And so, um, so with this, um, and also seeing the strong performance uh, in more controlled samples that were shown in the previous slides, um, the, the immunoprism assay, uh, we expect this to perform well with clinical samples. And I'm going to show some data now for immune profiling of uh, clinical style samples using FFPE. So this is a multi-section experiment. And so I'm going to talk about this. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of a preview. One of the things we were interested in was understanding uh, what a normal normal types of immune cell percentages might be in a um, in, in, in a in groups of samples and uh, different types of samples and so one of the ways to do that is uh, to be able to mine data from another uh, from from uh, to be able to mine data that we haven't generated and then generate data on our own and compare those two data types together and so that's what I'm going to show here We first wanted to, um, as I mentioned, compare immune cell estimates to other typical samples of the same disease type. So uh, what, to do this, we established a typical immune cell abundance of samples by mining data obtained from the Conversant Bio website. So what's cool is the Conversant Bio website contains uh, these flow cytometry reports for each of the DTC samples they have available. And they specify the relative abundance of, of, of certain immune cells in those reports specifically uh, CD4, CD8, CD19, and CD56 are the ones that we looked at. So we examined 122 reports from Conversant and recorded the immune cell abundance for each of the samples. And these flow cytometry values in aggregate give us an approximation of the abundance of immune cell types in a typical sample that may be run on immunoprism. And the table here shows the makeup of the diseases that were included in this aggregation. So at Cofactor, we collected FFPE samples of various tissue and cancer types. And we, uh, here we're, we were looking at 28 of the uh, FFPE samples that we gathered. And these samples were run on immunoprism. For a subgroup of the samples, uh, we also ran them on immunohistochemistry as orthogonal uh, work. And we wanted to measure the presence of, of, of a few of the immune cell types there, and I'll cover that in detail in a later slide. But as I mentioned, the table here lists the samples that were run, it details the disease, the percent tumor cellularity, the DV200, which is a measure of quality of the RNA sample, the total RNA extracted, and whether IHC data is available, and also whether the sample passed molecular QC. And um, there is one no in the passed molecular QC column, and it's about halfway down. So when we uh, processed these samples, we saw that 27 out of 28 of the samples passed QC, which is approximately 96%. And so in the rest of this section, I'm gonna present results from those 27 samples that passed QC. So in order to compare the immune content of, of typical samples to the estimate from immunoprism, we ran the 27 FFPE samples through the immunoprism assay and this figure shows the comparison when considering all types of cancer tissues, um, also just lung and just melanoma, by visualizing the distribution of typical immune cell abundance from the conversant bioflow reports as box plots. And then we're overlaying the immunoprism assays cell percentages of each sample on top of that as points. So for each of these segmentations, we can see that the immune cell abundance estimated by immunoprism is equivalent to the ranges expected for typical samples with an exception that CD56 is, uh, is with CD56 immunoprism is estimating the presence to be higher than that seen from conversance flow cytometry. I mentioned in an earlier slide that we compared um, eight of the FFPE samples to IHC and that's what I'm showing here where we sought to see how similar immunoprism measurements were to IHC. And uh, as we, as some of you may know, this, this can be a little bit of a, uh, of, a, of a difficult comparison, but still we were interested in being able to, um, to take a look at some of these cell types against the gold standard. So we compared CD8, Treg, and CD19 cell types. And as you can see, CD8 and CD19 correlate strongly with IHC with an R squared of, of 0 0.86 and 0 0.79 while Treg uh, has a mild correlation with an R squared of 0.6, or maybe I should say it does not correlate as strongly. 
So finally, uh, we uh, wanted, and Eric talked about reproducibility and being able to do this with, um, with uh, different operators and, and, and that type of thing. So we wanted to investigate the reproducibility of the, of the um, cell percentage estimates that Immunoprism uh, makes uh, using FFPE samples. So what we did is we extracted RNA from one of the FFPE samples. We split it into six replicates, and uh, these replicates were divided um, in half and processed by two people on different days and on different sequencing machines. And the figure here on the left shows uh, mean per cell type centered estimates for the replicates on the y-axis and each cell type along the x-axis. And for each cell type, we visualize the upper and lower first standard deviation as a horizontal line connected by a vertical line. In addition, we note the mean value for each cell type uh, below the x-tick labels for the cell type. Table on the right uh, that you can see shows reproducibility of the assay by the same operator and between operators on different machines. So amongst the replicates performed by the same operator, the average standard deviation across all samples is 1%. So this indicates a very high reproducibility uh, by a same operator. Similarly, when comparing the replicates performed by two different operators on two different machines on two different days, the average difference of means across all cell types is 0.8%, again indicating a very high reproducibility of the assay. So these data show that for all cell types, the reproducibility is, it, reproducibility is high with a standard deviation less than or equal to uh, less than 3%. And the cell types with higher means seem to have a higher variance than those with low means, uh, such as M1, CD14, and M2. However, these less abundant cell types uh, have a higher reproducibility of a standard deviation of less than or equal to 5%. Thus, we can conclude from these results that Immunoprism um, exhibits high reproducibility for FFPE samples. And in the final section of the uh, validation and data portion of the webinar, I want to uh, talk about controls. So, in order to ensure the assay is performing as expected, regardless of the presence or absence of immune cells in the sample, uh, we analyzed Immunoprism measurements of control material. So, control material consisted of spleen total RNA which we fragmented in-house to generate a positive control with known immune cell, cell amounts. And negative control RNA was generated from an ALK, RET, ROS1 fusion negative FFPE material from Horizon Discovery, which measurements showed to be uh, nearly absent, absent of immune cells. And to confirm the reproducibility of fragmented spleen RNA as a positive control, uh, six replicates were prepared and run through the assay by two different operators on six different days. And the figure on the left shows these results where the mean per cell type centered estimates for the replicates on the y-axis and each cell type along the x-axis. And this is the same way that we uh, represent here the first standard deviation um, as we represented in the previous uh, graph. In addition, we note that the mean value for each cell type is, is the same here in the x-tick tick labels. And from this figure, on the left, one can see that the cell types with lower means, M1, M2, CD4, Treg, and CD8, have higher reproducibility with a, um, a standard deviation of, uh, of less than 1%, while cell types with higher means, like CD19, um, and the total immune content, so the sum of all of the immune cells, have lower reproducibility with a standard de deviation of less than 3%, but in all, this experiment shows the fragmented spleen RNA is appropriate for a positive control as it can determine whether the assay is able to measure the presence of eight different cell types when uh, they are in a sample. Finally, uh, to confirm the reproducibility of the ALK-RET ROS1 fusion negative FFPE material as a negative control, three replicate samples were prepared and run through the assay on different days, and the figure shows the right the figure on the right shows the estimates for these samples on the y-axis for each of the cell types on the x-axis. And we can see that the five cell types have estimates lower than 1%, while three other cell types have estimates uh, less than 2%. And the total immune content estimate with the sum is less than 6%. So from this data, we conclude the spleen, uh, ALK, RET, ROS1, the spleen and the ALK-RET-ROS1 samples are appropriate controls for the immunoprism assay. And with that, 
um, I uh, will conclude the validation design and data portion of the webinar and I'll hand the presentation back over to Natalie. So thank you very much for listening. Excellent. Thank you, John. And so I, I think it's important to note that while the clinical performance of this assay has not been established and it's, it's beyond the scope of the validation study that John just described, I did want to take a moment to provide a bit more context about how these immune cell measurements may be applied to develop powerful biomarkers. And specifically with the right patient cohorts, such as those from a retrospective study where treatment outcomes have been recorded, we can look for predictive markers of response. And as I noted at the beginning of our session, when we consider the immuno oncology drugs being developed and the complex immune system that we're trying to understand, more predictive biomarkers are absolutely essential. And so in this example data that I'm showing, uh, using our research use only version of the assay, um, was used by a clinical collaborator to look at a cohort of 13 UPS sarcoma patients uh, who were treated with radiation therapy. And so here in this example, we're comparing the patients who responded to the therapy or those who were disease free um, greater than three years out of treatment. And then those who were non responders or those who were not disease free less than one year out uh, with the goal of identifying the most predictive biomarkers of response, which in this case includes the CD19 positive B cells. And so in this research report, which we call our biomarker report, uh, you not only receive the most predictive biomarkers from the assay, but you're also provided the rich statistical analysis of all of the analytes, which again removes the need for additional bioinformatic or statistical analysis. And finally, I want to highlight that in this research use version of the assay, we also take the machine learning tools that have enabled us to build our immune models one step further. We combine all of the analytes to generate the most predictive combination of markers, which is a powerful multidimensional biomarker. And in the case again of the sarcoma study that we're presenting here, we saw an increase of greater than 10% predictive power over these individual immune cell markers, which could certainly result in significant cost and time savings in a study. And so if you're in the biomarker discovery phase, this research tool is a great way to start to identify the biomarkers that you'll want to use for the downstream clinical applications. And we'd be happy to share more details about how this can be applied to your specific goals. And so just to wrap things up before we move into our Q&A, I wanted to again emphasize the exciting results that John presented today. The high sensitivity and the low input of the immunoprism assay delivers powerful immune characterization of solid tumor samples. And this is all made possible by our investment in generating these multidimensional immune cell models, which is a vastly different approach than the individual immune markers that have been used in the past. You can gain access to our technology via a variety of means, including the CAP accredited service that we've discussed in detail today. And the process for accessing our CAP workflow is simple. You'll start from our study design support at the initiation of the project, and it'll go all the way through to the delivery of the fully analyzed immune report with clinical sign out. And thanks to this CAP validation process that Eric described in detail, the powerful data delivered in this immune report may be integrated into the clinical decision making process. And we're grateful and proud of the collaborators who have helped us to demonstrate the utility of the immunoprism assay, both at large cancer centers and within the pharmaceutical industry. And we look forward to hearing more about how you might leverage this technology in your work. So now we'll open things up. Um, you'll have the opportunity to ask our team any questions you may have. And I know we're running a little bit low on time, so if we don't have uh, time to address uh, your questions today, uh, as Elizabeth mentioned, we'll certainly follow up by email to provide an answer. Thank you both, uh, John and Eric, for your time. Uh, and uh, now I will check the chat window and see what kind of questions we have coming in. So it looks like um, one of the first questions um, that we have coming in is, how does sample quality affect the results of the assay? Um, John, I think I'll hand this one over to you if you are willing to talk about sample quality and how that influences the results of the assay. Sure. So the, um, as, as Eric mentioned, we've been uh, CAPCLIA certified since uh, 2015. And a lot of that work started with um, simply looking at and, and trying to set up a um, a standardized and accredited way to work with RNA samples. And part of that work was understanding what affects the quality of RNA has on the results of not only RNA sequencing, which is really just a tool, but also on immunoprism. What we find is that from uh, around DV200 of 30% and higher, there's little effect 
on the uh, output of, of not only RNA sequencing data uh, with the methodologies that we use. Uh, that doesn't apply to all methodologies, by the way, certainly random priming methods and other PCR-based methods. But um, up uh, from about 30% DV200 and up, we don't see any problems at all. Once we get below DV200 of 30%, we can certainly work with those types of samples, but we would be in an RUO system at that point in time. Great, thank you, Joan. Uh, the next question, um, I'll turn this one over to Eric. Uh, the uh, listener asks, can the assay be set up as a cap assay in uh, in their laboratory? Uh, yeah, that's a that's a great question. So um, it can be set up in uh, any laboratory as a laboratory developed test. Uh, would require uh, validation though under uh, cap uh, CLIA guidelines, and so um, you could certainly. Uh, you know, get a kit uh, from Cofactor and then validate it in your own laboratory using your own samples, um, uh, using a process similar to what, what John described. Great. Um, and there's another question here uh, about delivering raw data. Uh, John, would you like to address that one? Yeah, so the, the methodologies, uh, both molecular and analytical methodologies for the immunoprism um, assay really are meant to work together. And so, um, you know, we, we, we can provide raw data from the, or I'm not sorry, we can provide um, um, output data or raw data for the assay, but without the coupled analytical uh, methodologies, it, um, it, it may not mean much, um, but we can do that. Great. Well, it looks like we're at the top of the hour. Um, and so I know we do have a couple more questions coming in the chat window. And so I'll make sure that our team follows up um, by email to directly address those. But I do want to be respectful of your time. So I'll turn it over to Elizabeth to wrap things up. Um, thank you again so much for attending. Thank you very much, Dr. LaFranco. I'd like to thank all of our presenters today. I'd like to thank Cofactor Genomics for sponsoring and finally, I'd like to thank those of you who came and spent this time with us. We really appreciate your willingness to come and listen, and we hope we were able to provide some answers for your research questions. So on behalf of FIOIT World's Global Web Symposia Series, I'd like to thank you so much for coming and wish you a great day. Bye-bye.